Good morning, church. How we doing? You ready to praise the Lord today? He is worthy of praise. Amen. Come on, let's stand up. Let's worship him. He is better than life. It's an all-sufficient grace Your power and your glory are forever on display And your loving kindness, loving kindness better than life Oh, oh it's better, oh, oh
life. Amen. Come on, let's give thanks to the Lord this morning and sing praise to the name that is above every name. I'll give thanks to you, Lord, and sing praise to your name, O Most High. I'll declare your love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the works of your hands and rejoice in what you have done. Give thanks to you, Lord, to you, Lord. and sing praise to your name almost high. Oh, I'll declare your love in the morning yes. and your faithfulness by night. For you, oh Lord, have made me glad. I will sing for joy at the words of your hands and rejoice in what you have done. Oh, 
that I will rejoice for. <laughs> One more time. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for. Yes, he has. I love it. Go ahead and take a seat this morning. We want to spend some time in prayer. I want to share some scripture with you and share some names of some folks that you might pray for. I was going to share the scripture last, but I think I'll do it first. Um, it's possible, do you think? <laughs> that at least one person, maybe many, some ones have come into this room for worship today with some heavy burdens on their minds and hearts. Maybe some challenges that you're facing. Maybe only you and God know about those. Maybe you need some courage to trust in his grace and help. Isaiah 41.10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In many centuries before, Isaiah quoted those words from the Lord to his people. Moses spoke to the people of God. And we find these words in the book of Deuteronomy. Be strong and let your heart take courage. All you who wait for and hope for and expect the Lord. Excuse me, that's from Psalms. The one from Deuteronomy is this. The eternal God is a dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. I like that verse from Isaiah that speaks about God upholding us with his righteous right hand. And then follow that with that book, that verse from Deuteronomy, where God says, underneath are the everlasting arms. I think about a forklift. God just carrying us in his arms when we need his grace and strength. So be strong and let your heart take courage. I'm not going to name every person we could pray for today, but listen to these names. And you're not going to remember them all when I give you a moment to pray in a minute. But the Holy Spirit might put one or two or more on your mind, and you can just quickly lift them up to the Lord. Uh, we want to remember the family of Carlton Clark, who went home to be with the Lord August the 4th. And we want to remember our, our family, uh, our, our friend, uh, our brother, uh, Brian Wilson, his dad, a retired pastor in the state of Oregon went home to be with the Lord August the 26th. There may be others who've experienced grief that you want to lift up in prayer. Some folks have been in hospitals in recent weeks. Some of these have been on our church center app for the prayer list. Daniel Ashwell, McKinley Dalton, Gary Sales, Kate, Katie Cheatham, Sandra Bryant, and John Labor. And right now we have uh, Charles Tyson and Debbie Montenegro in the hospital. Miss Montenegro will be having heart bypass surgery tomorrow. You want to pray for that? We sure want to pr praise the Lord for the salvations reported this week from our Brazil mission team. They're on their way back home. Uh, it's just incredible news. I haven't seen it all, but I know over 100 professions of faith and very big baptism service. Uh, Brother Mike Sumi got to participate in. We can praise the Lord for the, the results of all of our mission trips this year to date. Uh, and as we look to the future, uh, there's going to be a, an Asia mission trip later this month. Uh, there's plans for a Cuba mission trip in January. Um, look into the future, the short-term future. We want to be in prayer for God's will to be done and uh, elections taking a place all across our country. Uh, we need to pray for God's guidance. And as believers, we need to exercise our responsibility and take advantage of our freedom by going to the polls and voting we sure want to pray for God's blessings, but all the ministries and activities that are part of the life and ministry of Highland Heights Baptist Church. Let me give you a moment to pray silently, and then I'll close our prayer time. Let's go to the Lord now in prayer. Heavenly Father, in a church this size, we've got a lot of folks that are sick. 
maybe some people that are not directly connected to our church, but are connected to part of our church family. Many more than we've named today. I'm sure many more than we have named who are experiencing grief over the loss of loved ones. And some of that sense of loss and sorrow could be for the passing of someone uh, maybe many years ago. Maybe some folks are hurting and troubled and facing crises and difficulties. Lord, demonstrate that your grace is sufficient. Help them to sense you undergirding them almost like a, with a forklift, uh, sheltering them in your everlasting arms and upholding them with your righteous right hand. Father, I pray for protection for all of our government officials and their families. I pray for you to guide us and all of our brothers and sisters in Christ in our voting and upcoming elections. That's just one of the ways you want us to be salt and light in our culture. Help us to obey you in that and any other ways that you want us to be involved in helpful and redemptive ways in our communities and in the life of this church. Father, I thank you that uh, Pastor Josh has returned from a time of sabbatical, and uh, we look forward to hearing him today. Just fill him with your spirit and preach your word through him. Have your will and your way in our hearts and lives and in the life and ministries of Highland Heights Baptist Church. I ask all these things in Jesus' strong and precious name. Amen.
generations falling down in worship to sing the song of ages to the Lamb. And all who've gone before us and all who will believe will sing the song of ages to the Lamb. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above them all. Yes, all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions. Your name, it stands above them all. And the angels cry, Holy, all creation cry. always 
forever. He always has been and always will be. Regardless of what we say, regardless of what we sing, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And all creation joins in in praising the name that is above every name. Amen? Father, we thank you this morning that we can humbly yet boldly approach your throne and sing songs of worship and songs of praise proclaiming that you are the only one worthy of our praise. You are holy, holy, holy. We join with all heaven and all creation on earth in proclaiming that you are holy forever. God, as we open up your word this morning, Father, may we allow May we allow your word to pierce our heart. May we not be so wrapped up in self that we miss our purpose. God, may your word move and work in this place today. We thank you for your scriptures. God, be with Pastor Josh this morning. Give him strength and power that he needs. May he bring your word in boldness today. God, I thank you for the next few minutes, for what you've already done, God, but over these next few moments for what you're going to continue to do. Thank you, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. So in case you didn't know it, my name's Josh. Man, uh, I had one of our uh, worship interns came up to me uh, this morning. He said, hey, I've been wanting to meet you. I said, hey, I would have been wanting to meet you too. Um, man, it is overwhelming to be back. And part of that in particular is simply a gratitude for the opportunity to step away and this thing called sabbatical, particularly because it's a reminder that we need rest, but also that it's a reminder that our rest isn't found in moments off or away, but in the person of Jesus Christ. Because you can be away and not be sustained. But we're in Je when we're in Jesus, he sustains us. He provides for us peace that surpasses understanding as we follow his will and walk according to his ways. So this morning, I feel a little bit emotional coming back. I do want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to so many who uh, joined the sabbatical prayer group and spent time praying uh, with Mandy and I over the past month and, and so incredibly grateful for the power of prayer. I, it's, it's this. I had a professor 
say, and I've said it even from this pulpit, we believe in the power of prayer so much that sometimes we actually do it. But let me ask you this. In the past month, have you seen God move in his church? See, I'm a believer that God moves as his people pray. We understand that in 2 Chronicles, there's a promise given to Israel, and yet it's a principle for God's people throughout generations that when we cry out to him, he is faithful to hear us and to move and to work in wondrous ways. So it's been good to be away, and as we have prayed, we've seen God do so many incredible things. We already heard from Pastor Butch about uh, the mission team and the over 100 people coming to faith in Christ as we sent our team of 16, 17 uh, down to Brazil, and, and as they continue to come back, we celebrate with them this, the glorious things that God has done. We, we celebrate the things that he's doing in our church, continuing to bring new people and stepping into our, our new members class. Our deacon celebrated that. We talked about the people that we get to minister to through our food pantry. We talked about just some of the wonderful things we're seeing God done. How about this one? That we got to baptize 19 people a couple weeks ago. Or that we launched a Hispanic life group. And I want, to, I want to beseech you that it is not because somehow we have lined up and done the right programs, but rather that God's people were praying and that God heard those prayers and God moved in the midst of his people. And he is worthy of our praise, honor, and glory because we celebrate the great things that he has done. We've been walking through this series called The Seven Commands of Christ. It's really interesting, the video, because like the first line of the video, it's like following Christ is not easy. Somebody want to say amen? amen? Like so, oh my gosh. It's not easy. But he is good. He is worthy. We've been walking through this series and we talked about these seven commands, which again, if I want to remind you, are, are utilized to teach the basic principles of what it means to be an obedient follower of Jesus Christ on the mission field all over the world. And again, I would tell you, church family, that that is not true just overseas, but it is true here in Rustburg, Virginia as well. Now, we must believe the gospel, that salvation is not anything that we have done, but it is what Jesus has done for us. I was talking with a pastor friend this past week, new friend. He came and spoke to a group of uh, KOZ leaders, which uh, if you're unfamiliar with that, is Kids Outdoor Zone. It's something we're relaunching here at Highland Heights as an opportunity not simply to minister to the children and students of our church, but as an opportunity to reach out to the children and students of our community that we might get them away from screens and get them outdoors, but mainly get them to Jesus. And by the way, if you like to hunt or fish and you love Jesus and you think you want to be a part of this ministry, let me know. I'll help point you in the right direction. Get to shoot things and point people to Jesus? Yes, you do. <laughs> That's a good day, brother. I'm just telling you. You're to believe the gospel. 
Not us, but him. We take that first step in celebration of our faith through the waters of baptism, representing that we have died to self and now we live for Christ. Josiah preached on sharing the gospel and being a light in our community. And Dr. Wheeler talked about being a people of prayer. Jackson spoke of being a church that loves one another well. And I didn't set this up right. I'm just going to go ahead and lay it out from the beginning. Because coming back, I got giving. What does it mean to be a generous people because God has been generous to us? And next week, I'm going to tell you, you're going to want to be here next week because we're going to celebrate communion together, reminding ourselves of what Jesus has done for us and is still doing in us and desires to do through us as we continue to seek his face. But today you get giving. A command of Christ that we would be a generous people. But we're going to look at it a different way. Can I just set you at ease? We're going to look at it a different way. Yes, giving, generosity. But I want to talk about something particular referencing something that Dr. Wheeler said in his sermon on prayer. I want to talk about living with hands open to the Lord. Because I got to be honest, I don't think that's something that we truly do very well as followers of Christ. See, Dr. Wheeler, a few weeks ago, he preached on the classic posture of the Jewish people when they would go before the Lord in prayer. It's actually one that we often use in worship today, or, or many of you may use in worship today, that when we're coming before the Lord, hands go up. And he spoke a little bit about some of the reasons why, and we're going to dive into some of the reasons why that posture, whether it be physical or in our hearts, is important for us in our walk with Christ, in our walk of faith. See, when the Jewish people would pray, their arms would go up, and what was happening is that their prayer manifested a physical expression of worship. Their prayer began to manifest a physical expression of surrender. Their prayer began to manifest a physical expression of faith. It's kind of like this. If you have kids, particularly if you have boys, you understand what it's like to get shot at with like Nerf guns and water guns and anything that they can shoot you with. And so when my boys, especially when they were younger, maybe Logan still, they'd come around the corner with their Nerf gun and they'd be like, hands up, dad. I'd be like, you got it, hands up. And then I'd get shot anyway. And I don't think they understood. (laughs) That hands up meant surrender, which then automatically meant that I had to find the nearest Nerf gun and shoot him back. Because that's what good dads do, just so you know. Good, that'll preach. Man, I didn't even write that down. See, that Jewish prayer, it it manifested the surrender. You got it, you win. I'm yours. And I gotta tell you, as Dr. Wheeler preached this, though I knew this, I got that imagery stuck in my head. I think it's one that demands some further exploration for us this morning. This open-handedness to God that says, God, I want what you want for me more than I want what I want for me. 
I need, God, what you have for me more than I need what I think I need. I'm going to worship you, Lord. I'm going to follow you, Lord. I'm going to obey you, Lord. Because even when my mind doubts, even when my heart is filled with fear, I know that you are God and you are good and therefore I trust you. Let me ask you a simple question this morning. It's not to pick on anybody, just go ahead and let you know. How many of you have the scripture, Jeremiah 29, 11, in your house or on a journal or maybe on a coffee mug somewhere, just raising hands? Y'all got that, you know you do. Man, that's a good scripture. God speaking to his children. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. It's plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And the only problem with this is that Jeremiah is writing to the Israelites as they struggle through the beginning of captivity in Babylon that was going to last 70 years. Can you hear them? Be quiet, Jeremiah. You can't call this good. I don't want to hear it, Jeremiah. You're telling me in the midst of this, God's for me? Jeremiah's like, yes, I am. Hmm. How about some of our other favorite verses that we often quote, like Philippians 4, 12, and 13. Paul writes to the church in Philippi, and he says, I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Good for you, Paul. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. Why? Because I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. And we read this verse and the church in Philippi might have read this verse and they're like, sure, Paul, sounds good, but you probably had all your stuff figured out and I don't. And we kind of feel like jerks because he wrote it from prison. (laughs) See, let me give you the big idea to start. Living with hands open to God has absolutely nothing to do with your circumstances. But it has much to do with having a growing faith. And it has much to do with being able to live in the freedom and joy that Jesus has called you to, whether you believe it or not. Let us be reminded. Let us be reminded that God has not called us to do anything which he hasn't done himself first. We can't speak of living with open hands without beginning with the open hands of Jesus Christ, our Savior. I think about Luke 22, 42, where we read Jesus' prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, his brow dripping with sweat and bloody perspiration before the crown of thorns was put on his head. Crying out to the Lord in anguish, knowing what was going to await him only a few hours later, and praying, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, God, but yours be done. Jesus faced the cross, surrendered to the Father's will with open hands. Do we understand the significance of what Christ has done for us? He didn't cling to his rights to avoid suffering. No, he stretched out his hands upon the cross for the forgiveness of my sin and your sin. Isaiah reminds us that Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him, and by his wounds, we are healed. Jesus opened hands 
on the cross, which models the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of surrender and love for us, that he would give up his life so that we might live, that he would die so that we could have eternal life. And it also models for us what it means to truly live life for the glory of God the Father. A life of complete faith and obedience, trusting in the Father and sovereign plan that would bring about his glory and get this, that was going to bring about our good. Church, I want you to hear this. Jesus' example challenges us to consider our own posture of having hands open to God's will rather than to live as people who are clenching tightly to our own plans and our own desires and our own wants and our own dreams and our own things. and When has any of that really made you satisfied? But Jesus satisfies to the utmost, amen? See, Jesus' open hands calls us who are believers 2,000 years later to trust God even when it's hard to surrender our lives fully to him. So I want to give you five ways this morning that we are called as followers of Christ to have an open-handed posture. What this means for us as we're striving to walk in obedience. The first thing is this, that having an open-handed posture, it's a posture of surrender. It's a posture that unmistakably exclaims, God, I am wholly yours. Like standing in front of the Nerf gun, you got me. I surrender to your ways. And unlike the five-year-old, he's not going to shoot you. To live with open hands is to live with a heart of surrender, regardless of the circumstance. See, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 encourages us. You might have this one on a cup too. Trust in the Lord with what? And lean not on your, in all your ways, and he's going to make your. If you don't know that verse, if it's not hidden in your heart, I encourage you to memorize it this week. Yes, trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all that you are. The word heart for the Hebrew people wasn't just a feeling. It was a knowledge that led to a faithful walking out of what God had called them to. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. See, this idea, this posture of surrender means acknowledging that God's ways are higher than ours and that his plans are always for his glory and for our good, even when we don't understand them. I want, Lord, what you want more than what I want. I think about the story of the life of Abraham, which is often a reflecting point for the people of Israel over the years. They would continue to go back to the story to say that Abraham walked by faith. And as Abraham walked by faith, we too are called to walk by faith, trusting God, even when it doesn't make sense. If you know the story of Abraham, he leaves his homeland with his wife, Sarah, or you can have Abram and Sarah, Sarai, which God later changes their name to Abraham and Sarah, leaves and he's on quite a journey because when he leaves, he's not exactly young and he doesn't have any descendants. And yet God promises Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. And it's not till this man is a hundred years old that then God says, here's a son. That's crazy. By the way, God can do the crazy. God can do the impossible. What God did in Abraham's life, God's able to do in your life, and God's able to do in my life, and God's able to do in his church. Praise God. In Genesis chapter 22, 
that precious son of Abraham, the one son of Abraham, God goes up to Abraham and says, hey, Abraham, you know that son that I gave you? Yes, God, I'm so thankful for the son that you gave me. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go on a little hike. I love going on a hike with my son, God. Thank you so much. That sounds really good, God. That's a great idea, God. Okay, and on this hike, I want you to sacrifice your son. Say what, Lord? I don't know if you know this, but it took a long time to have this child. I thought we were getting up in age. Now we're really getting up in age. That time's expired, God. There's no more. So I want you to sacrifice Isaac. Abraham says, listen, I don't understand it. But the book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham trusted God, that God was going to provide either a way out or even if Isaac were to die, that he was able to bring him back to life. He didn't know how God was going to provide, but he trusted and obeyed with open hands. In the end, God provides the ram in the place of Isaac, showing that when we surrender with open hands, God meets us. And by the way, when he meets us, his provision's enough. See, surrender isn't about giving up and defeat. It's about yielding to the one who knows and loves us best. It's about saying, God, not my will, but yours be done. This morning we sat in Deacon's meeting and Chad Shelton told a story of how God just spoke to his heart. He was on a walk with his dog. He has a little chocolate lab. If you haven't seen pictures of her, she's beautiful. He's on this walk with his dog and he decides to let the dog off the leash and The dog goes running and he's got kind of like one of the little collars and he's watching her run, watching her run, watching her run and watching her all of a sudden run further than he can see. Kind of presses the button, dog comes back. He says it was as if the Lord hit me. It's so easy for me to get ahead of God. Instead of coming to the Lord and saying, God, what do you want for my life? What do you want for your church? And then regardless of his answer, being willing to be obedient to that. Oh man, surrender. Are there areas in your life that you need to let go of and surrender to the Lord this morning? We'll get there. Having open hands, it's not just a posture of surrender. It's a posture of worship. It's saying, God, you are worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory and all of my adoration and all of the world's adoration. Open hands, it symbolizes that posture of worshiping God. In Psalm 63, 4, David declares, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I'm going to do what? Lift up my hands. See, lifting up our hands in worship is an outward expression of the inward reality. And it shows our dependence and adoration for God. To worship him with all that we are. There's some really odd stories in the Bible, by the way, just in case you don't know. For instance, there's a story about David, King David, worshiping. He's worshiping God with all that he has and all that he is. The Ark of the Covenant coming into the city. And his wife gets mad at him. She says... David, you look like a fool. Let me go ahead and lay something out for you. You will look foolish. You will look foolish, utterly foolish, for worshiping God and following God with all that you have to a world that does not know God. I don't know. 
I was listening to an old sermon of Adrian Rogers. I love that man's voice. I wish I had it. I wish I had Pastor Butch's voice. I just like, give me something. Man. He talks about a college student going off to college and sitting in in one of those classic first year college philosophy courses where the professor was an atheist and everybody knew the professor was an atheist and the professor tended to make it his ambition at the beginning of each semester to call out the Christians and to point out the folly of the scriptures. And so at the beginning of this particular semester, the professor does what he normally does, and he says, how many of you are a Christian and believe that the Bible is the word of God? And though there might have been some, and, or even many who grew up in church, there was only one who raised his hands. The professor says, you really believe the Bible is the word of God? See, when I read it, I read all these contradictions. I don't understand things. There's all these things that you can't prove, da, da, da. And he just goes and he unleashes on the kid. Kid looks him straight in the eye. He says, see, I, I understand why you read the Bible and think all these things. The professor says, you do. He says, yeah, see, the Bible was written as a love letter to God's children. Professor, you don't understand it because you're reading somebody else's mail. <laughs> Amen. Look, I want to tell you, you're going to look foolish for following God's word. David's wife called him foolish for dancing before the Lord. By the way, the way scripture describes it, it was kind of wild dancing. He won't hold him back. Didn't grow up Baptist, all right? I'm just telling you that. <laughs> and David's response, he says, I will become even more undignified than this because God is worthy of my worship. I won't hold back. I'm going to give him all that I have. We read time and time again of people in Scripture just worshiping the Lord with all that they have, like Mary in John 12, 3, pouring out the expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, crying upon his feet, and wiping up the ointment and the tears with her hair. The act of worship was costly. Even the disciples thought she was foolish, but she was open-handed to Jesus, not caring what others thought. Her hands were open in an act of worship that honored God, and Jesus blessed her for it. See, worship isn't just about singing songs on Sunday. It's about living a life that honors God every day. And are we holding back parts of our life from him, or are we worshiping with open hands that are giving him all that we have, all that we are, because he is worthy? Oh, challenged by this posture of worship, challenged by the clock on the wall. This is what you get when I don't preach for four weeks. It's your fault. <laughs> Man. How about this? Having this posture of open hands is a posture of receiving. It's God, I want what you want for me. This posture of receiving. I think about Matthew 7, 7 through 8, where Jesus says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the doors are going to be open to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks the doors are, go are going to be open. And then he goes on to say this. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? The reality is, is too often we come to God with clenched fists, holding on to our own ways, our own solution, our own desires, our own control. And yet God invites us to open our hands, to receive his grace, to receive his blessing, to receive his peace in a way that we can't experience when we're trying to hang on to it all ourselves. And listen, this isn't health and wealth gospel. This isn't, that's not what I'm preaching to you this morning. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. It says this. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. 
We're half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. Church, we're far too easily pleased. We're holding on to junk. God can't give us what he wants to give us because we're holding on to junk. We would be well, do well to be reminded, as James says, that every good and perfect gift is from above. It's not by what we hold on to that we receive what's best for us, but rather by being open-handed to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he places his good gifts in our hands, we receive what God knows we need. Man. Open hands, it's a posture of working. Do we understand that God calls us to work with our hands? We're clinging so tightly to doing the things we want to do that God is unable to use us in the areas that he wants to use us. We cling tightly to our things and we cling tightly to our time and we cling tightly to our talent, thinking that the only way that God can use us is this narrow path. And God, if you would just use me this way, I know that the world would be blessed. Don't you think highly of yourself. Man. Yet it is open-handedness to God. To go where he calls us to go. To do what he calls us to do. That we are blessed and the world is then blessed because they see Jesus working through us. A posture of open hands is, God, I'm going to do what you want me to do. I'm going to do what you want me to do. And we'll close with this final point that nobody likes. But all of us need open hand. Open hands, it's a posture of giving. It's a posture of giving, of being generous, what God has blessed us with. Proverbs eleven twenty four 24 and 25 says this, one person gives freely yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper but who, whoever refresh, and whoever refreshes others will themselves be refreshed. I got to tell you, Chad Shelton was on fire this morning in our deacon's meeting. He was talking with me just a moment after deacon's meeting, told another story that he had heard. I said, Chad, I'm just going to use that so you can go compliment him. But he talked about how there was a couple of guys that felt led by the Lord to start a financial institution, a bank, or what have you, and the Lord blessed it. A long time down the road, had a son come up to him and say, Dad, how in a world of greed, how do you fight, how do you combat greed in this world when you work for a financial institution and dad looks out at his son without missing a beat and says, live with extravagant generosity. See, because Jesus has been extravagantly generous to us. One of the tangible ways we're able to model the love of Jesus to a watching world is to live with extravagant generosity to others. Hmm. 
We see this in the early church in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 45. It says that the believers shared everything they had. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. They even sold property and possessions to give to anybody who had need. Their hands were open, and those open hands became a powerful testimony to a watching world of God's love and generosity through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ on their behalf. Man, when I think about open-handedness, I have to ask myself this question. Are we just giving the Lord our leftovers or are we giving him our first fruit and our best? Let me speak to our young adults in the room because I realize like school's back in session, all of those things might have a number of young adults or maybe you're just starting to think about generosity and this idea that that might be something that Christ has called you to. And the temptation is this, Lord, I'm going to give when I reach this point. Lord, I'll give more when I get there. But here's the reality. It's the reality. If we're not faithful with little, we won't be faithful with much. That sounds biblical, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. Young adult, if you're just at your first job making minimum wage, be faithful with what God has given you and watch how God is bless, will bless you. It's very interesting to think about Malachi chapter 3 to recognize the call to bring the tithes into the storehouse, to be faithful with generosity towards God's, not then, but God's people here, contemporary God's church. And he says, do this and watch that I don't open up and shower you with blessings. And again, it's not prosperity gospel. We don't know how God wants to bless us. We don't know how God wants to protect us. We don't know what God wants to do in us and do through us. But we do know that if we're living in disobedience, he's not doing any of it. Not going to do any of it with us. I read a few stats and we'll close. That just broke my heart. Let me give you the good one. It says 77% of tithers give more than 10%. I was like, man, God, that's really good. And then it said this, but only 5% of the church actually tithes. For most churches, calculating the average of what people give, it's somewhere between, I've heard as low as two, as high as 4% of their income. And I want you to hear, this is not a commentary on tithing. This is a commentary on surrendering and being faithful. So let me ask you this. Are you living with open hands? Meaning, are you trusting God in every area of your life? Surrendering to his will, worshiping him with all that you have, receiving his blessings, working diligently for his glory, and giving generously to build his kingdom. It's a posture that says, God, everything I have is yours. I want you to hear this. When we live this way, we think we're going to have less, but it's false because God flips it on his head. When we live this way, this unique thing happens and we experience greater freedom and greater joy than we could possibly have living, holding on to everything so tightly for ourselves. Today, I challenge you to commit to living with open hands just as Jesus did. I challenge you that your life might reflect his surrender, his worship, his willingness to receive, his dedication to work, and his generosity in giving. This morning, I want to encourage you. This is a unique way. We don't always do this here at Highland Heights. I just felt impressed to pray for you this morning, to pray for us as a church. So I'm going to ask three questions, and as I do, I just want you to go ahead and close your eyes this morning. 
And if you raise your hand to any of these questions, I'm going to pray for you at the end. And certainly if you want to respond in another way, we'll have some prayer partners down front. Or if you have another prayer need, we'll have some prayer partners down front in just a minute. But I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to pray for you. And that's what we're going to do. The first question is this. Have you trusted Jesus to forgive you of your sin? To provide for you eternal life? Maybe this morning you've seen the open hands of Jesus, how he lived, surrendered to the Father, died on the cross and rose again, but you see something more. Not only were his hands open to God, but you realize that his hands were also open to you, that he loves you, he died for you, and this morning he's calling you to trust him for salvation. And if that's you this morning, if you'd like to trust Jesus for salvation, all I'm going to do is pray for you. I just want you to raise your hand. Just raise your hand. I want to trust Jesus. Thank you. The second question is this. Maybe you're a believer in Jesus, but you cannot say at this moment your life is surrendered to Jesus. Jesus. Maybe there's sin that needs repented of or something Jesus is calling you to do that you've been putting off out of fear or doubt. If that's you this morning, I just want to pray for you. Will you lift your hand? I want to surrender to Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. A number of hands. Thank you. Finally, this morning, maybe your hands have been closed and that you haven't been living with radical generosity the way that God has called you to. Maybe you were worried that ends aren't going to meet. But this morning, as we consider this open-handed posture, you recognize that God loves you and that you know you can trust him. And so this morning, you want the strength and the faith to be obedient with your resources, your time, your talent, your treasures. If that's you this morning, Can you just lift up your hand so I can pray for you? Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for those in the room who want to trust you for salvation. That they might recognize that the surrender thing is scary, but it is good that they might recognize that there is no salvation outside of coming to you and confessing our sins and asking you to come into our hearts and our lives and then living for you by faith. And that in doing so, there's freedom and there's joy that they've yet to experience. God, I pray that for the one that needs to know you this morning, that Lord, they'll speak with someone before leaving the church. They'll speak with someone as they're having lunch. They won't won't be able to sleep tonight until they've come to the end of themselves and to the cross of Christ. This morning, for those who raise their hands that there's areas of their life that are not surrendered, and Lord, we understand that that's all of us. God, help us to see how you're challenging our hearts to lay down our wants, to lay down our perceived needs, to lay down the sin and the shame that Hebrews says act as shackles and drag us down so that we aren't able to run the race that God has called us to. God, help them to realize that it's for freedom that you have set us free from these things for your glory and for our good so we can trust you with these things. God, release them of what holds them back from passionately pursuing and following you, Jesus. God, for those of us who live clenched fist with our time and our talent and treasure, may we just repent. Jesus gave it all. All to him I owe. Oh, what a line from a faithful hymn. As if it wasn't all yours to begin with. May we be faithful 
and radically generous, that you would be glorified and that people would be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, let's stand and worship this morning as we respond to the Spirit's moving. I know who I am Because I know who you are The cross of salvation was only the star. Now I am chosen. I'm free and forgiven. Yes, I have a future, and it's worth the living. I was made to be tended a grain. I was called by name, born and raised back to life again. I was made for more. So why would I make a bed in my shame when a fountain of grace is running my way? I know I am yours. I was made. Are you grateful that you were made for more? And I'm grateful that he knows me by name. Amen? Amen. Well, we want to share a couple quick announcements with you this morning, church. You can stay standing or be seated. Uh, I'll talk fast if you listen fast. Is that a deal? 
Okay, good. All right. Hey, real quick, if you're new to Highland Heights, thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Super glad you're here and uh, glad you said yes to the invite, however that looked. Hey, there's a QR code in the back of the seat in front of you. If you scan that, that'll take you to a website that has information about Highland Heights. And if you want more information than what's there, just fill out your information and we'll reach out to you this week. But thanks for being here with us this morning. And as always, church, we're grateful that you give here to fulfill the mission of the church. There's boxes at the doors on your way out. You can mail it in, carry your pigeons fine. You can bring it in to the church, whatever you like. The, the, the email, uh, sure, I guess we could take email. That'd be a new one. The church app, uh, the website. Yeah, we're just grateful that you're giving here as we reach out into our community and really out to the world. Continue to pray for our Brazil team as they're actually on the road making their way back to Lynchburg today, right now. So pray for them. Also, I want to remind you, next Sunday night, 6 o'clock, right in here for church members, there is a business meeting, okay? 6 o'clock, right in here next Sunday night. Also, this coming Thursday, we are starting, and Pastor Josh, this might be something maybe you could lean into a little bit more, called the... The prayer meeting, but it's about the, what is the, what's the actual, the book? I took off my mic. I, okay, he took off his mic. Never mind. It's, what, what is it called? The, uh, I forget the name of the book. Hey, listen, there's Transforming Prayer as a book, but really all you got to do is show up on Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, come to Entrance One. We're going to have coffee there for you. you. But more than just waking you up in the morning, I believe God wants to quicken our spirits as well. Amen. And yes. so we invite you to come to the prayer meeting. It's not going to look like any prayer meeting you've ever been to. In other words, you're not going to sit around and everybody's going to go and give 45 minutes of prayer request and then you're going to pray for five minutes. That ain't what we're doing. All right. I'm just letting you know. It's going to look different, but you're going to be blessed. You're going to want to come. Uh, We are going to be using Daniel Henderson's uh, style of prayer. And uh, and so it's going to be crying out. Be pray. How about this? Come as a participant, not as a spectator. Let's cry out to the Lord together. I believe as we do, he's going to move in some tremendous ways. Fair enough. See, I was right, man. I knew you'd do a better job at that than me. Also, the 29th, so in in a few Sundays here, Sunday the 29th at 7 p.m., Our young adults are going to have a night of worship down at the Student Ministry Center. That's our our youth building down here on the other end of the property. 7 o'clock. Now, it's young adult night of worship, but anybody's welcome to come to worship, okay? So don't feel when we announce, hey, it's a young adult night of worship. They're leading it for us, yes, young adults, but everybody's welcome. I hope I'm, yeah, I'm I'm just going to say I'm correct on that. So come on out. Hey, these nights are always awesome. You will be blessed and encouraged if you come to the Young Adult Night of Worship. Again, 7 p.m. September 29th. And Pastor Josh, I'm glad you got the scheduling a little wonky. That was a great message this morning on giving, man. Thank you very much. That was, that was convicting about using all our resources. Yes, thank you. Hey, church, before we leave this morning, let's say our verse together. Who's got it memorized? <laughs> First John 3.23, praise the Lord. Here we go. Now this, the name of Jesus, and love one another as he commanded us. Have a great week, church. Live on mission. See you next Sunday.